You know, what's going through my mind when I see a place like this, as a restaurateur, you have to be a dreamer and you have to be able to take chances because there is so much stacked up against you when you want to open a restaurant. And especially a restaurant down here right now, you really have to have a vision for what you think is going to happen. You can feel something here between the cobblestone streets and old buildings, the close proximity to the river and its history. There is something about this place that resonates. Parts of it reminds me of Denmark. Laclede's Landing, it's the oldest district in the city of St. Louis. Rooted in a past centered on river commerce, St. Louis got its start here on the edge of the largest and most traveled river in the U.S. In modern times, the landing has served as a melting pot of bars, clubs, and places to eat. Often the last stop for those in town to catch a game who want to experience St. Louis nightlife or visit the Gateway Arch. However, the last decade has seen a decline in the number of businesses and visitors to the landing. Crime has played a big role in scaring away would-be patrons from the brick-paved streets and once thriving little businesses. Driving from Southern Illinois, I would come up here 20 years ago, and this place was full of people. The bar scene that had dominated here has all but died off. But the story of the landing may have an unlikely revival, a savior in the form of Korean fried chicken. If, if anything can revive this place, it's food, because food is love. That's what it's all about. As a chef, I need to stay curious in order to evolve. For me, that means looking beyond a great meal to learn more about who made it and what inspires them to cook. Every great city has great food. I'm going on a journey around the world right here in St. Louis to find good food and experience other cultures. I'm on a quest to find passionate chefs who cooks from the heart because food is love. It's gonna be delicious. Food is love. Love your food. In the list of things Americans instinctively claim as being generally, well, American, fried chicken probably comes in just under apple pie and baseball. So to hear the phrase Korean fried chicken raises fundamental questions about what makes an American original into a Korean dish. That's where the kimchi rice comes into play. They serve a host of Korean options like Korean barbecue and obviously kimchi. One of the most popular items on the menu at Kimchi Guys is Korean fried chicken. This is my friend Mun Sok So, a Korean immigrant, serial restaurateur, and owner of Kimchi Guys. He agreed to show me around, but first he has to brush me up on some basics of Korean culture. Soju, we were talking about you're supposed to pour me, right? In Korea, nobody pours their own drink. You know, here you can pour your own drink, drink your own drink. Yeah. In Korean culture, you would always pour for the other So what person. if you're real thirsty and you can't wait for somebody? Uh, well, you know, you're going to be really thirsty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I would pour this for you. It's a Korean, Korean spirit. And it's an up-and-coming spirit, the biggest in the world now? It's the number one selling spirit by volume in the world. Thank always you. first, and then, okay. then you would pour this one. You don't have to use two hands. Okay. But I would have to still use two hands. Okay. Uh, 16 billion bottles are sold every year, and it's growing still. Okay. And it's probably the only spirit here in the United States that nobody knows about. That's very interesting. Yep. And then uh, when we drink, I would, because you're older and I, I respect you, I would not drink in front of you. I would have to turn around and drink that. So you can drink really? the same way. Okay. And so, you know, we would cheer, come yeah. back, and then I would drink this way. In the wake of the success of his drunken fish restaurants in places like Ballpark Village, right outside of Bush Stadium, Munsuk recently opened Kimchi Guys in the much less obvious location and with hopes of it attracting new attention to the riverfront and changing the dynamic of Laclede's Landing. You know, I used to come to Laclede's Landing 20 years ago and, and that was the place to be. So it's kind of had a demise. There's no doubt about it that the Laclede's Landing has gone through some really, really tough times, you know. Um, I mean, the death of the landing probably in the, in the last couple of years 
in terms of a lot of the business that have kind of uh, gone out of business down here. And I think, you know, I think we're in a very unique pivotal point of the landing. Uh, right behind you right now, there's a new street that's being put in. And uh, we're so excited about uh, where the landing is going, you yeah. know, with all the renovations that has happened at the arch grounds, uh, the demolition of the arch parking garage, putting a park in, um, new businesses that are being attracted to this area. There's a lot of fun activities yeah. okay. uh, that are happening right now that wasn't happening three yeah. years ago. It's a community effort mm -hmm. to try to get people down here again, right? Right. It'll be kind of a renaissance down here, if you will. I think so. It's, it's transforming uh, into something different now. And I think there's, you know, places where people want to kind of linger on and do the same things, but you know how things has to change. Yeah. New things has to open up. Yeah. And it needs to transform the neighborhood into something different. Yeah. That's part of my vision is to provide a different experience uh, bring something different to the neighborhood that brings value to the community. And besides the great food, a big part of the value here is the culture aspect. Munsuk is a part of a growing trend in recent years of an influx of Asian Americans to the suburbs of St. Louis. I remember being immigrated here in the 1980s. Um, Korean cuisine was not even talked about, it which just wasn't popular. Yeah. And kimchi was probably the stinkiest food in the <laughs> Korean cuisine, you know? Yeah. And so not just something that you didn't talk about it, but it was something that you kind of avoided talking about, yeah. you know? And so now kimchi is in every trending restaurant, yeah. not just here mm -hmm. in St. Louis. I think it is the culture that we li live in now. People are more willing to try different things. But you know, that's a great thing about being chefs because we know that that's the connection between us mm -hmm. and how you bridge mm -hmm culture. You know, there's over 50,000 Korean fried chicken shacks in, in South Korea right now, more than McDonald's worldwide. We're trying to bring that, that level of popularity uh, of Korean fried chicken into the Midwest market is what we were thinking about. Yeah. So what exactly goes into Korean fried chicken anyway? Some people told me that, well, it is uh, something that was created in the 50s by American soldiers coming to Korea. The military being there and bringing the Southern style fried chicken and, and I think a lot of the Korean people uh, adapting or tasting and then trying to put their own spin around it. Yeah. The popularity of Korean fried chicken really came about uh, in the late 1970s. And then it jumped back to the United States. It's getting more popular in the East and West Coast yeah. uh, in the United States now, uh, but we're definitely the first Korean fried chicken location here in St. Louis. The start of really, really good Korean fried chicken is the brining process. We have water, sugar, Korean sea salt, and soy sauce. And obviously it's to tenderize the meat, partake uh, uh, flavor into the meat. We'll put the chicken into this brine and uh, literally it'll stay uh, for 24 hours before we prep it up to fry. This part uh, is a very important part of making sure that the chicken comes out very, very juicy yeah. and crispy on the outside. This is the secret right here. This That's is right. the crust. The starch uh, that gets combined with the flour makes uh, the shatter kind of a crisp to the outside. Kind of a formulation that we've been working on probably in the last year and a half, two years. We fry it in two different temperatures. If you go to South Korea, um, uh, they'll fry it in an open fryer uh, at one temperature, take it out, uh, rest it for about a minute or so, and then they'll put it into a different temperature. And, and really at a higher temperature to crisp up the skin of yep. the outside. Mm -hmm. it's trying to get the right temperature and cooking time so that you're not overcooking the meat, yep. as well as trying to crisp up the outside. And that's really the technique and the science yep. behind cream fried yep. chicken. So with the, the second coating is where we're gonna use the gochujang, right? The sauce. And that gives it spice. That gives it the spice, uh, the flavor, yeah, all of those things. And I mean, obviously the kimchi is a big part of the story here too. You know, I think a lot of uh, people are hesitant to try kimchi. You know, mm -hmm. it's all like, well, it doesn't smell good yeah. or it's yeah. strong, Yeah. but it's really good. What does it mean, kimchi? Kimchi is the fermentation 
or pickling of vegetable. Uh, the idea of making kimchi was to preserve food for a longer period of time. Yeah, I'm Scandinavian. And we, we, we do uh, sauerkraut. Sauerkraut is, is, is your kimchi. So in Korean culture, I, I, I heard that uh, you have in the fall, you do like a kimchi party where you try to make kimchi for the whole year, right? Mm -hmm. That's called kimjang. It happens once a year. It's an international festival where everybody kind of gets together and they make this kimjang or kimchi okay. Okay. that'll last for the entire year. Obviously when you first make kimchi, it's very fresh. And then every day it starts to um, turn, you know, and ferment. What, when can you say, okay, now I'm ready to eat it? Uh, three or four days, a week? You can um, pretty much make this right when the brine cabbage is done and eat it immediately. Or you can eat it a year and a half later. Yeah. And that's the variation and, and, and all that spectrum you'll have a different taste of that kimchi. But we're gonna um, quarter these, take the core out, and we're gonna start putting the, the Korean salt on them. Okay. And it's really to um, kind of break down the cabbage a little bit and try to uh, put the salt into the vegetable. And once you salt these and put them into the container, it'll continue to release water and it'll create a kind of a salt brine, uh, li liquid brine in here. Most important part about the brining process is that is to make sure that it's evenly brining throughout the cabbage. You're, wow. you're doing a great job. Well, thank you. Have you made kimchi before? <laughs> no. Huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> you're an expert already. <laughs> this is the ingredients that goes into marinade. That's a lot of ingredients. It is a lot of ingredients that goes into making kimchi. We got the sugar, uh, garlic, um, green onions, uh, that's Korean radish, okay. uh, the Korean red pepper, um, the garlic chives, ginger, shrimp paste, um, okay. uh, as well as onions, uh, garlic powders, fish sauce, and that's a, um, a sweet rice flour that's okay. been uh, reduced. And we'll put that all into a bowl and we'll mix that together okay. in preparation to, uh, for the brine cabbage, we'll mix that together. That's yep. the, really the final step of making kimchi. It's almost kind of like uh, painting, you know, he's stroking uh, the paste onto each leaf, put the paste uh, leaf by leaf and get it all together, put it into the container here. We're going to put the special lid uh, which will suck all of the air out and we'll put it into a uh, refrigerator and we'll let it sit there for a while. Now that I know the secrets of making kimchi and Korean fried chicken, I'm eager to try some of the food at Kimchi Guys myself. And the menu here is nothing short of impressive. Wow, look at this spread. There is so much good <laughs> stuff here. Let's start with this one here. These are four kimchi uh, that we offer here. Um, okay. Obviously that's the Napa cabbage kimchi. This is the, the spicy radish kimchi. This is the white radish kimchi that is normally served with Korean fried chicken. Okay. It's kind of our version of coleslaw. Okay. You know, and it's uh, kind of a mild pickle that goes along well with the Korean fried chicken. And this is our cucumber kimchi uh, that that we use on a multiple different things. Super and this cool. is kind of our version of our Korean fried chicken. And this is our original sauce, but we also have uh, three other sauces that accompany this Korean fried chicken. Okay. The real KFC. The real KFC. That's right. Let's try it. Okay. Wow. That is delicious. Mm. I'm hooked. Mm, me too. So if we go way back, uh, uh, when you first started Drunken Fish, I mean, mm. did you go to cooking school or where did you get your inspiration from? Uh, interest in food for me, uh, even, even since I was a little kid, I mean, I was always watching cooking shows and okay. like Julia Childs. I mean, I, I, I just, I was very uh, interested in food. Growing up in a household where my mom was cooking all the time, I mean, okay. she was cooking three meals a day. Uh, it's always a Korean meal. Developing a palate um, throughout the years um, for unique cuisines mm -hmm. and always trying out different places. Uh, but I definitely wasn't culinarily trained. Okay. But I knew what tasted good. So a lot of times if you're classically trained, mm -hmm. you have boundaries that you think you can't sure. pass. Sure. So I've met great chefs over the years that, you know, have taught themselves. Sure. And 
you know, that's great because you, you, you can think outside the box. Right, right. To get a better understanding of Korean culture and ultimately what motivates the menu at places like Kimchi Guys, Munsuk has invited me to meet his teacher and culinary muse, his mother. So Munsuk, I know the custom is to bring a uh, gift the first time you come to somebody's house. So mm -hmm. uh, one of my servers in my restaurant, his name is David, he's Korean. Oh, nice. Uh, his mom made this and uh, it is uh, ginseng root. Uh -huh. And I guess it's more for medicinal purposes, but I right. wanted to make sure uh, you know, that it's okay to give alcohol. You know what, my dad loves to drink and he's gonna appreciate that very much. Okay, yeah. great. I'll just give you a little background on my parents. I mean, they're just very, you know, simple. They're just hardworking people, you know? What prompted them to come over here? I think two things, you know, one, I think, you know, my, my older sister has uh, muscular dystrophy. But at the time in Korea, um, they didn't know what she had. There's a lot more opportunities in America, better medical facilities. It's always that kind of perception, you yeah. know. They decided that uh, they're gonna take a chance and move everybody over. And uh, I remember as a young kid, we lived in the kind of a shady area of, of St. Louis and they would have to leave us uh, at the house by ourselves. But it was really tough on them, them both having to work and there was no choice. You didn't have a choice. I remember that as a young kid, they would always call and I mean, I just always heard my mom crying over the phone, you know. They still can't speak English today after almost 40 years, but back then trying to work and, and on, on all of that and trying to, you know, put food on the table, it was, it was, it was tough for them, you know, yeah. very, very tough for them. But you know, humble beginnings makes you who you are. Yeah, it's part of who I am as a person for sure, growing up that way, you know. My mom always asked me why I continue to keep, you know, um, growing. And it's the progress that I enjoy, the journey that I enjoy. But at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're making something that puts a smile on somebody's face. Yeah. So your mom is ready for us? I, I, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have to take the shoes off? No, just come okay. on in. Hello. It's my dad. Nice meeting you. My mom. Nice meeting you. My niece. Nice meeting you. <laughs> we have a, a, a bottle for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you with, much. with ginseng in it. Ginseng, yeah. Ginseng, yes. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. My parents have been living here in Maryland Heights for many, many years. And so we understand you taught them how to cook. <laughs> And yeah. you have a garden in the back. We would love to see your yeah. garden. Yeah, they're always growing something. Yeah, everything back here is uh, edible. You gonna tell you? Papa, just mark it. Just watch Cucumber. Cucumber over here. Okay. It's green onion here. You gonna tell me? And then you can see this is radish. yeah radish. Radish. Uh -huh. Okay. Sesame seed, uh, like sesame leaves. It's all here. Garlic, onions, cucumber, radishes, lettuces. An expansive garden tucked into the backyard of an unassuming suburban home. This is actually Korean garlic because he actually got the, the garlic from Korea. Okay. And then he planted them, you know, so he's been kind of saving a few every yeah. year and then we'll plant those. Like this. So when you pull it, yeah. And you probably had this before. It yeah, tastes it's very, very yeah. Yeah, great. Delicious. Like a, yeah, they'll plant this, and then every few months they'll have something else. And this is this is the gochujang and denjang, and they're fermenting that right now. So this is house-made Korean miso. Yeah. Yeah. My mom will actually take the beans, ground it, grind it down, and and start uh, making this. Wow. She makes her own gochujang. He has his way of like labeling things, and these are seeds that he would actually harvest himself. Wow. Well, it's not store bought. This is all, you know. He, yeah. After he grows it, he'll leave a few to, you know, turn into seeds, and and he'll save them, dry them, save them, and then we'll we, we'll plant them. Hot pepper seed. Hot pepper seed. That's pepper amazing. Seed. This is from like last season. This is morphine, okay? Okay. <laughs> sustainable farming. This is a this is sustainable farming at its yes. yeah. I talk about like people talk about farm to table eating. This I mean this is like their daily life. Yeah. They they'll pick stuff and make it. They'll pick stuff and make it every day. Mm. 
After harvesting a few things from the garden, it's off to the family kitchen to prepare a traditional Korean meal. This is a process Munsuk's mother has repeated here in the kitchen day after day, year after year, for most of her life. Watching her turn things from the garden out back into a full meal, you get the impression that she takes cooking for her family very seriously. Don't ask her about recipes because she doesn't have any recipes for anything. <laughs> she doesn't buy taste and feel. So I said, when did you start learning how to cook? And she said, uh, when I got married. Yeah. <laughs> Several things that are very, very common is you're going to see a lot of side dishes called panchan. You're also going to see uh, usually a, a, a meat dish uh, as an entree that's being shared by everybody that's at the table and a soup, you know. Uh, and you're always gonna see a kimchi at the table. That's the one thing that's probably 100% given. My mom's been an, an inspiration for sure. She's been a, a really, really good home cook, you know, and, and uh, she's always cooking Korean food, you know? <laughs> yeah, which I always crave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a typical side dish called kongnamur. It's just a steamed uh, uh, bean sprouts mixed with very, you know, traditional Korean uh, seasonings. <laughs> But these are the, the kongnamur and doraji is, is the two most common vegetables. You go, you go, you go to mm -hmm. This was from the back. The this the is garden. from the back. Huh? Oh, this one he said it grows from the front. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah, this one, th that's what you tasted earlier outside okay. in the garden. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and you see my dad's out there and every, every day, day, like just tending the garden and, you know. And he takes pride mm -hmm. in, you know, eating fresh out of the backyard, yeah. you know. The smell of simmering miso and fresh vegetables is unbelievable. And yeah, you just grab a little bit of the, uh, the panchan. These okay. are the side plates. Okay. Uh, and fish. This is the toraji that came from the front yard. Okay. This is the garlic shoots that came from the backyard. <laughs> this is <laughs> all vegetables. All vegetables. A lot of vegetables. Okay. Okay. This is the, the kind of pickled radish. Okay. The care his mother took to prepare a meal from the garden that they planted and tended to themselves was a good reminder of what cooking is really all about for me. The opportunity to slow down and spend time with those that are most important to you. This is really good. Oh yeah. That's the toraji. You'll have the same meals three times a day. They'll make a different meat dish, different soup dish. Soup becomes a part of the meal. I think in, in American culture, you serve it first. Yes. Munster's family was gracious. Growing up with three meals a day like this, it's no wonder Munster developed his appreciation for food. I've been a chef all my life. I'm 52 years old and it's the first time I've had that, 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 <laughs> that, that, that. It's absolutely delicious. Well, it's exciting that uh, I'm sharing your first Korean meal, mm -hmm. you know, in my mom's home. You know, it's part of your journey, and that's why it's so interesting. It's like, this is what inspired you to do what you do today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is where it all comes from. It does come from here. It's yeah. your mother's fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Food is love. Food is love. Yeah. And love your food. Exactly. <laughs> well, I'm coming back for dinner tomorrow. You told him that, right? <laughs> good meal, good conversation, and newfound friends has me feeling grateful and ready to go back to the kitchen with some of the things I've seen here. Munsuk has found a way to bring his culture to a part of the city that at first glance may not have been the best place for it. To his own admission, the concept of kimchi guys wouldn't have worked here 15 years ago. But things are changing. The very idea that food and culture must be relegated to designated area of the city and kept inside a cultural box, it segregates us from trying something outside our comfort zone. I see what Monsak is seeing. I can, I can feel it, I can sense it. Hats off to people that try what he's trying to do. There's a new day here. Food is love. That's what it's all about. It'll bring people down here. It'll bring people together. I feel it. Thankfully, there are heroes like Munsuk. 
heroes that have such an ingrained passion for their heritage and its food that they want to share it, evolve it. This is where I draw true inspiration to learn and evolve my own way of thinking. This is what inspires me to bend the boundaries of what I think will work and not work. This experience has opened my mind to new ways the texture and flavor of kimchi could be a complement to dishes that I prepare myself. Fresh kimchi with apples. Since my last visit, the landing is now directly connected to downtown St. Louis. In a way, this is the beginning of a new era for the landing. If I can introduce just one person's palate to something new like kimchi, then by extension, I am teaching them to appreciate an aspect of another culture. That motivates me. One Korean fried squab coming up. That to me is just proof that food is love.